My name is Riley Foreman, and I am a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. It's my pleasure to introduce our panel, Getting a Handle on Social Media, How Data is Engaging Gen Z Without Losing Gen X. Our panelists today are Matt Nadeshot Haig, CEO and founder of 100 Thieves, Omar Raja, com commentator, ESPN Digital and Social Content, Blake Stuchin, Vice President of NFL Digital Media Business Development, and Christine Wixted, Senior Partner Manager, Twitter Global Content Partnerships. Our panel will be moderated by Jordan Solomon, partner at Arctos Sports Partners. The panel will run for 35 minutes and we will leave 10 minutes at the end for questions. Please use the chat function on the right side of the window for discussions during the panel. And because this is a social media panel, please head to Twitter to submit questions for our panelists using the hashtag analytics of social. Questions will then be selected by the moderator. With that, I'll turn it over to Jordan. Thanks, Riley, and it's an honor to be here moderating this session of such a fantastic and highly relevant group of experts. And so, um, so why do we convene this session about engaging Gen Z and losing Gen X sports fans? Well, because there, there's robust data showing that Gen Z and Gen X are consuming engaging with sports very differently from each other, and importantly, from older generations. For example, a recent survey from Morning Consult found that just 53% of Gen Z respondents identify as sports fans compared to 69% of millennials and 63% of overall adults. And that same survey found that 39% of Gen Zers say they never watch sports at all. Additional trends, including cord cutting, proliferation of second and third screens, a perceived preference for highlights or red zone instead of watching full games, the growth of esports and video gaming, and a plethora of user-generated content and platforms such as YouTube and TikTok and Overtime, are often cited as potential threats to the professional sports, media, and entertainment ecosystem and the traditional revenue models. So is this true? Like, should, should leagues and teams be concerned that these trends will reduce their future fan bases or threaten their current revenue models? And how are they addressing this and what should they be doing to do better? I'm lucky to be here with these experts to address these topics and take them head on and we'll make this really interactive. I'll ask the panel to give me relatively quick answers and encourage you to jump in and, and have a lively discussion. And so um, maybe to start with the first question, Omar first to you and then Christine to you. What's, what is your data, Omar at ESPN and Christine at Twitter, what's your data telling you about Gen Z and their interest in sports and how it differs from Gen X and, and older fans as well? Yeah, I think to start, you know, when we look at, you know, the demographics on our Instagram page or even on TikTok, we can see that they still are pretty engaged, right? Like when you go through our uh, TikTok page or our Instagram page, there is still plenty of sports content. I do think the one difference is that there is an appetite for stuff outside of sport, uh, outside of just direct sports highlights, right? So some of it is user generated content. I think one of the big tests for me when the pandemic started and there wasn't sports for two months was, okay, you know, I was a big video gamer growing up. Let me see what Call of Duty looks like in Sports Center, and will fans accept that? And I think, especially with that young audience, I think you saw, um, you know, friends tagging each other and, and, you know, a lot of interest in that as well. So, I, listen, I think there will always be a huge interest in sports, but you also just have to be mindful of the other stuff that um, younger sports fans are interested in. Yeah, I would say the same. I think when we look at the conversation that's unfolding on Twitter around sports, I think obviously you have your, your traditional stats and box score type of tweets. But I think what people really come to the platform for and what that younger generation is looking for is really the culture side of sports. I mean, being around the action and, and understanding who's wearing what sneaker, what are they wearing to the game? What music are they listening to? I was just on a space um, that was hosted by uh, KD before I got on here. Spaces is a new kind of audio conversational tool that we're testing. And just to hear him not talk about about his highlights or his stats and uh, what sneakers he wore as a kid or, or things like that. I think that's kind of the other side of sports that we're looking at. And, and from a conversational perspective, that's what we've seen kind of pop on Twitter as, as of late. And, and Blake, how about for you, for the NFL, you know, what are, are you seeing different generations interact with your content differently? And how are you addressing? I know you guys have taken a very different approach recently than you may have had, had five, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, look, I, I think the exciting thing about this is, in many ways, our strategy actually hasn't changed for decades, which is we distribute our content on the most widely available reach mediums. Historically, that was TV and radio. Now, it's still those things, but also a broad range of other places. It's never been a better time to be a sports fan because you can engage in so many different ways. 
And it's our job at the NFL to think about all these differences in the ways fans engage with content and serve all of them. So when the audience that we reach is everybody from 12 year old kids to 80 year old fans, we're going to do that by doing different things for each of them. And so it means we've got the live game on television in a, you know, in a format that's very familiar. It also means we're distributing live games, clips, highlights, bitmojis, lenses, filters, all kinds of new things, showing our players with their helmets off and creating lifestyle content around that to serve our fans however they want ultimately to express themselves and, and enjoy their NFL fandom. And, and Midshot, you, you come at this from an interesting perspective. You're a traditional stick and ball fan, but you are one of the leaders in, in the emerging esports and esports content area. Um, you know, what's your what's your take on this? Especially when you look at it from first a traditional stick and ball. Like, is this? Are you? Would you be concerned if you were working at a traditional sports league or or at a team? And then, what? How is esports addressing and and maybe tackling this opportunity? Yeah, I mean, look, I, when you give me those stats that only like fifty percent of like Gen X are participating with real, that's mind blowing to me. Because even though that I love gaming and it's been my entire life, I still love traditional sports. I'm a huge golf, NBA, NFL, I, a, anything and everything. I watch it. Uh, I think the biggest difference for me when I look at gaming content compared to traditional sports is accessibility. And what you have in the world of gaming is that it's always on and it's always on the creator and it's always on the professional esports athlete to build a bigger and broader career with more access accessibility for the fans. So there's always content 24 seven. And some of my favorite moments, even before this panel started, when Blake brought up the mic'd in moments with the NFL, you get to see the personalities of the players actually shining through because they might be the best in class in whatever sport that they play, but who are they off the field and why should I be a fan of them? And I think that's why esports is growing rapidly is just because when a player gets on stage and they're competing at the highest level, you were just watching them for eight hours yesterday when their food came in and they got it delivered and they're talking about their lives and there's just so much transparency. So you're always rooting for them every step of the way. So I, I, I just think for traditional sports, there needs to be more accessibility to the actual athletes and who they are off the field um, so that you can feel that connection uh, through and through, no matter where they are at in their careers. Yeah. And, and to jump on that, um, you know, you know, athletes will always ask, you know, how do, how do I get on your Instagram page? You know? Uh, and that, that question hasn't changed over the last three to four years. And the biggest thing I say is 50% of it is you do something great. You're really good at the sport. The other half is people saying, Oh, I can relate to him. He's just like us. Oh, he, he, I would love to hang out with, you know, player X. And I think that's something that's really interesting is like if if the fan base, you know, kind of gravitates towards a player or thinks he's cool or thinks he's funny or, or reminds them um, of themselves, um, you know, play those those highlights tend to do way better for players that are kind of quiet and, and don't really say much. Yeah, look, to jump in on that as well, I'll, I'll give an example. Um, Juju Smith Schuster is yeah. a terrific wide receiver, a Pro Bowl caliber player, but notably, he's also an avid gamer a person who is a great personality on social media in a variety of formats. And he's turned himself into an influencer as an NFL athlete um, and showcasing an entirely different side of his personality and has really built a tremendous fan base around that. And so for us at the NFL, we want to encourage that for our players. It gives them a chance to um, build their own brands and, and showcase themselves and, and grow. Um, and at the same time to lean into it, to give them more opportunities like it. And so we're, we're doing a lot more uh, with that, but the, the credit primarily goes to Juju to be able to recognize as, you know, as, as a real modern athlete coming in and being fully formed on social um, is, uh, is something that, you know, we get really excited about because we, we think there's a lot more to come with that. And to that yeah. point too, I mean, these kids who are her kind of owning the league, I mean, you look at a Patrick Mahomes, a Juju, like they're all younger, right? So they grew yeah. up with this and, and they use it in that authentic way. And I think you're just going to continue to start seeing that organic or authentic content come to life because it's a part of their daily lives. I mean, you look at Tom Brady, who was, who came to Twitter about two years ago now, and of course he utilizes it, but you see it in a different way because of the way they kind of utilize it throughout their career. So I think that's a, a key too, is that you're seeing these athletes who have grown up with, with social and understand it. Uh, and can utilize it in authentic ways moving forward. And Christine, are you seeing, because you work across the teams and leagues and esports as well, are you seeing leagues changing 
their approach to this, like encouraging players to do it more or creating more flexibility in the last couple of years or even in the last year? Yeah, I think everyone is an advocate for having their players on the platform utilizing in a way that is authentic to them. Um, I think there are ways to learn how to use each one differently. Not one piece of content is going to work the same way across the different platforms. Um, but I think the more athletes that are on Twitter and are using it in, in, a, in a good way, I think is, is definitely going to kind of increase usage from that standpoint. I mean, even if you look at the last year, right, going through a pandemic, social justice, we saw a lot of athletes tap into that and show you a totally different side um, of a way that they utilize their platform. And I think teams and leagues were very much um, for that, empowering athletes to do that. Um, so I think you'll just continue to see more of that. So again, it's not just on the court, it's off the court too, which again, I think kind of sums up how we've been talking about how you kind of see that, that different side of the athlete. And, and Jordan, I'll, I'll give, I'll give Christine and her team at Twitter a, a lot of credit here. You know, the, the Twitter team and all of the, the platforms do this and they, they've really built out their own sports groups to do a great job with it. At the leagues, we, we can evangelize only so much, but ultimately the expertise really lies with these platforms. Um, the Twitter team, by way of example, works directly with our clubs, with our players, in addition to our own team, to help onboard players, to give them advice and best practices. I mean, I joined the NFL in 2013. We had a Facebook account, a Twitter account, and a staff of one. And you fast forward to where we are today. We partnered first with Twitter in 2013. We put up four highlights a week. That was a big deal. Um, but, you know, look ahead to where we've got, oh, and touchdown dances were illegal. So, yeah. so oh, yeah. instead, we've, you know, we've gotten to a place, I think, without speaking to a whole host of factors that led us to get there, we've gotten to a place where we're really celebrating the players themselves and the athletes, in addition to ultimately evangelizing our sport um, and trying to make it as accessible as we can to our fans. And, you know, again, you, you, that celebrations point gets to just the ways that we continue to showcase that kind of content um, for our fans. It gives them a different perspective in addition to things like highlights in the live game action. Yeah. And, and Nate shot from, a, from a esports and gaming perspective. I mean, what, what are some of the lessons you've learned or things you've done that you, uh, that you think really would translate in addition to some of the, uh, what you've heard already here? Well, to be honest with you, I, I just love to continue to harp on accessibility. You know, uh, again, we really push our players to do more just outside of practice. I mean, obviously, it's not as similar and as physical to traditional sports, but they spend a ton of time uh, scrimmaging against other teams, trying to be at the level that they need to to win championships. But we push them to create as much content for themselves as possible so that they can you know, pack the biggest punch with their own individual brands. Um, and we assist them too. I mean, 100 Thieves, the company I started about four years ago, we have like a 25 man production team and we're creating content around our players that doesn't really even involve or any lift of their finger um, besides a couple minutes for interviews here and there. So it, for me, it's always content, 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 like traditionally in esports before, it was all about winning and and that's all people really cared about. And over the last three years, you know, we've now uploaded hundreds, if not thousands of videos by now. Um, and I think it's made a great deal of a difference uh, in differentiating us from other teams in the marketplace. Um, and, you know, one stat that always uh, brings me so much joy at the forefront of gaming is that in 2018, there was 50 billion hours of gaming content consumed on YouTube. And that was the same amount that was consumed on Netflix that same year. So the gaming vertical alone on YouTube is, in my mind, I'll probably already surpass the amount of watch time on Netflix. So not all that is esports, but a good part of it is. Um, so it's trending in the right direction and yeah. just continuing to churn out as much content as possible. So just building on that point, Nate Shot, and others have made as well about, you know, non-game content. Uh, or, you know, you're, you created House of Highlights, yeah. And, you know, in many ways, right, the, the way that Gen Z and Gen X engage with, with sports is not by watching the full game, but by watching highlights. Either. Right. Tell, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Like, is, is either short form content or highlights or some combination of the two, is that going to kill the traditional sports ecosystem? Are people ever going to watch these long games again? Or is it actually a great way to ensure that they do watch those games over time? Yeah, I think my experience is a bit different. Like I wanted to be Nate Shot, uh, you know, 12 years ago. I wanted to be this successful YouTube creator and and I lo and I loved watching all the the teams then and and so for me in 2007, 2008, 
I was just on YouTube all day. I was trying to record my PlayStation 3 Call of Duty skills. It didn't pan out uh, on YouTube. But what actually brought me back to sports was Twitter. Um, you know, I would log on to Twitter and all of my friends would be tweeting about the heat. And I'm like, you know what? I got to get back into this. Um, same thing with the Dolphins. The Dolphins had like a one in 15 season in 07 and the, and the Patriots went 18 and one. So it was like complete different sides of the, the spectrum. So, you know, for me, Twitter made me like become a sports fan again and become super engaged with it. And the amount of times, whether it's Twitter or Instagram, where, you know, someone will live tweet a game, whether it's a national championship or an NBA game, and it'll make me want to um, watch the game. So that's how I've always kind of viewed it. I kind of view my, my job is to make people more interested in sports. Yeah. And to your original question, Jordan, I think what always resonates with me the most is even though a lot of these younger kids are watching small highlights on sports center of house of highlights, I still think that value accrues back to the brand equity of like the NFL or the NBA or whatever league it's actually taking place in. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, accessibility has been a common theme throughout this entire panel. And one of the things that the NFL did really well last year, which I don't think I've seen any other leagues do this is they allowed some of the biggest streamers on Twitch to actually co-stream and watch the NFL games live with their audience. And I know that there is a whole list of problems with broadcast rights for other leagues and being able to just broadcast that game on YouTube and certain networks have certain deals. Look, I'm not paid to think about that. But for me, like, it's always just going to come down to accessibility and the easiness that these young kids have to find these games um, because they're, they're spending the most time on YouTube. They're spending the most time on Instagram and Twitter and TikTok. And now even when, I know it might not be as correlated to this conversation as possible, but every network now has their own app. You got Peacock, Paramount. It, it just everything has been spread out so far away from each other. But everything is accruing back to YouTube and Twitch and TikTok. And the NFL and all these leagues now need to figure out a way to be there as much as possible. Um, and I, I think that's where they'll find success. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in to build on that. And thank you, Nate Shot, for pointing out, you know, we're, we're really um, thrilled to see the level of traction we've gotten from a model that's for us always been about access. And you're right. These things can be complicated. The, the rights landscape um, has some unusual dynamics to it, but the focus for us for the last 10 years has been about trying to continue to make the games and everything else that we do around it as accessible as possible for our fans. So, you know, you, you mentioned it earlier, we partnered first with Twitter back in 2017 to carry Thursday night football games in this tri-cast model where they were on broadcast television, cable television in the form of NFL Network, and then also on Twitter, Move that over to, to Amazon and it's been on Prime Video and now on Twitch for the last three seasons. And we just announced a few weeks ago uh, the, the next decade of visibility into our live game rights, both with our existing broadcast partners as well as with Amazon. We're really excited to see that kind of investment from the broadcast partners, but also the fact that what, what is kind of talked about a lot in those deals is that the games are going to be not just on traditional television, but also all of them with their own digital platforms. And obviously Amazon has, you know, exclusively a digital platform in the form of Prime and, and Twitch. Uh, and as part of that, so much of this is about not just making the games available, but then also continuing to personalize them. So whether it's co-streamers on Twitch being able to broadcast it, not impersonating Buck and Aikman, uh, if it's a Fox feed, but really bringing their own fans into that experience so that they can talk to them, you know, in this communal way that feels so intimate and native to Twitch. We're going to do a lot more with that. But similarly, look at the innovation you're seeing even with our traditional broadcast partners. We partnered with Viacom CBS to put a wild card game on Nickelodeon that this was past awesome. January. That was I, I think it's one of the most innovative and creative live games I've ever seen. I'm, I'm biased here, but I loved it. I sat and watched with my six-year-old who spent more time watching NFL football than I could get him to do in the first five and a half years <laughs> of his life. So, you know, it's, I think all things that are really exciting because the promise of technology for us as we keep trying to lean into the future is to say this affords us the ability to do things that we couldn't do before and really the the challenge and excitement we get when you know working with creative people like Omar and the team at ESPN is coming up with those ideas to keep making it that different and that relevant so that we're reaching audiences of any age 
I think to just to kind of bring it full circle here, you bring up the CBS Nickelodeon game. People come and watch that live on, on TV, wherever they may watch it, but then they're coming to Twitter to talk about it. I remember pinging Blake the next day. I'm like, you know, the top 10 trending topics were all Nickelodeon <laughs> themes, not even the players. It was slime. It was SpongeBob. It was everything that was happening in that game. So I think the beauty for us, and obviously we, we've dabbled in different uh, long form content, short form content, whatever it is. And I think highlights are that sweet spot for Twitter, but that wouldn't happen if we're not seeing it live on TV. Right. And I, I think when you see a big play happen, whether it's a Jalen Sugg three or that Nickelodeon game and being able to then react to it on Twitter and just logging in and seeing your timeline in full chaos. Uh, I think that's the beauty of, of to kind of TV and Twitter together and live sports and, and Twitter together. And uh, to Omar's point that brought him back to, to kind of get back into traditional sports. And I think while I'm biased, I think that's the beauty of, of Twitter and sports when you kind of boil down to it. And by the way, get, give, some credit to our, our friends of the broadcast networks as well. ESPN pioneered this model with megacasts. They do an incredible mm-hmm. job with it. And, you know, CBS Viacom to do this with, with Nick, one thing that's I think often underappreciated is to be able to pull that off. That, that's real investment and thoughtfulness to make the game so differentiated. Young Sheldon was doing explainers on NFL rule changes. SpongeBob did the pregame show. And yes, when players scored touchdowns, they got slimed. Um, but it also means for our friends on the you know operations and broadcasting side, they have to think about those things ahead of time, build original graphics, develop storylines, and think through the logistics of that. Um, it's a really exciting time to be doing these things because you know the, the world is open up, but at the same time, we, we you know we need to um, appreciate just how creative and how much executional work it takes to be able to pull that off so well. Umar, is that is that uh, your perspective as well? So that this idea that um, just innovating and trying new things is going to is going to really help both ESPN, but also the partners you all work with? Yeah, I, th- I think 1000%. I think that's probably been the most exciting thing about all the different platforms coming out, whether it's TikTok or digital or social or YouTube, Twitch, is that the brands are now starting to experiment where they didn't have to for about five, 10 years, especially in the early 2000s. I felt like everyone was kind of comfortable and they kind of knew, hey, we don't need to take big risks. And now over you've seen over the last 10 years is a lot of leagues and, and companies have had to take risks. I remember five years ago when no league ever wanted, you know, to post the highlight on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook. And now they've all kind of changed their tune and they've realized, oh, this drives more awareness for our sport. So I think it's interesting, but I think five, 10 years from now is going to look completely different, especially the content. Yeah, I think the innovation is key. I mean, if you would have asked me and Blake seven years ago when our relationship started, if we were going to be inserting showtime cams into the end zones of NFL stadiums throughout the pandemic year and posting that authentic, organic celebration content to Twitter, um, I would I would have called you crazy. But to, again, see them innovating and, and with their different partners, I think just speaks to the different audiences you're trying to tap and and, and reach through through those different creative formats. So to Omar's point, I think innovation is going to be key as we can kind of continue to move forward and kind of start to, to think outside the box. You know, one of the things Nate keeps talking about access and we talk about it a lot at the NFL too. Um, we've shifted a lot of our thinking from just the, the access problem of how do we make games and other content accessible to fans to what now becomes a marketing and discovery challenge, which is how do we having now secured the ability to make the games as accessible as they can be. And we still have work to do to always improve, but how do we then actually communicate and break through the clutter to make sure that our fans and those who are prospective fans or more casual fans know that this is coming. So when you talk about highlights being everywhere, which is so key to a, a focus of our strategy, one thing that, that's often important to point out is when we put an in-progress highlight on a platform like Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, as we do more than a hundred times every single week during the NFL season, if it's during the live game window, you're going to see a link right there that takes you directly into the game. And by the way, the benefit of technology now is that we're able to send that user directly into a live feed. We can track that viewer so that we're able to, you know, confirm that that person's having both a good experience and that we can still record the um, the actual viewership data the same way that we could on traditional television. Um, and it's increasingly a much better experience for our fans than in the past having to uh, search and not necessarily have the same um, ease of use to be able to get into that game. But does that, do any of you have this risk, which is I think embedded a little bit in the title of this panel? Do, do you share this risk or have this concern that um, by doing all of this, that you're going to start to alienate the the older fans, whether they're 
you know, the, the Gen X or, you know, the baby boomer generation by doing all of this? Or do you think it's just different platforms, different people? Don't worry about it. I mean, I don't work in traditional sports, but as long as they got a game on CBS, ABC, Fox, and TNT, I think the baby boomers are going to be just fine because that's what they're conditioned to know, and that's what they, they've known their whole life. So that's my take, but I'm probably not the best person to ask. I, I tend to agree. I think you're you're creating different formats now for different audiences and what they're receptive to. I think when we tr we think about traditional sports and traditional viewership, you think about that age group. And then as we innovate, we're, we're catering to the, the new generation that is obviously bigger and kind of growing. And it's a target audience that not only we want to reach, but brands want to reach. And I think at the end of the day, you're just creating different formats to cater to those different audiences and what they're receptive to. Yeah. Yeah, 1000%. Like the content that we post on TikTok is much different than the content that goes on linear or digital or the other platforms. Totally. And differentiating those platforms is super critical, right? In knowing who the audience is. Yes. Yeah. Yes, 1000%. Just like looking at your analytics and, and knowing, okay, this is a younger audience here and this does well over here, but this doesn't do well uh, maybe on Twitter or Instagram. So TikTok is especially one of the, the most interesting platforms where you have to really change uh, I had to re I had to re relearn that platform and be very different um, compared to what I had done over the last five years. Yeah. So I want to talk just really quickly about sports betting and the impact that that is having or may have. Because you know some of the research that we've read at Arctos is really talks about how fans say fans who bet are far more likely to watch games and watch games for longer than they are if they're not uh, watching those games. So curious, especially Omar, Christine, were you able to see this data across your platforms? You know, we know fantasy sports has been a great engagement tool over time. What, what about sports betting for the Gen Z and Gen X populations? Is that likely to be a great tailwind or is it much ado about nothing in terms of engagement with sports? Christine, you want to start? Sure. Yeah, I think for us, I mean, we look at at the conversation that occurs on the platform and how that can influence odds one way or another. I mean, you look at when Elon Musk tweets sometimes and stock goes up and down. And I think it's the same with sports betting, right? Odds can change based on what certain people tweet, and what you find in terms of having them tune back into a live game. I think just generally, if you are betting on something and you have something uh, skin in the game, you're going to be more inclined to watch that to the end. Right. I think being able to have the highlights on on our platform help just solve solve that issue. But if, if you're seeing that in real time and, and you got you got money on the line to to, to see what's gonna happen, you're, you're gonna be tuning in live. So um, I think there's conversation on our end that helps kind of filter those, but from a tune in perspective, I think it's definitely gonna help those kind of tune in longer and, and, and more just to again, see at the end of the day uh, who wins. I mean, you look at March Madness this, this, past, uh, this past March and so many different endings and games and, and things like that. And all of that is aligned to the conversation happening on the platform, helping influence that so again um i think it'll, it will help tune in um but from a twitter perspective it's more the conversation that's happening around those um versus the the viewership yeah i think we get about 200 submissions every day on, on our instagram page and i think 20 of those will be a group of friends that are watching some game and you think it's the fourth quarter you think it's about to be this crazy game winner but they're just trying to see which player or which team is going to make the first three pointer because that's what they bet on um and there's so many different bets whether it's first quarter first half second half, third quarter, um, where I think fans are just super engaged. And I just, I think with fantasy, also with, with sports gambling, I think what we are seeing is that fans are more engaged throughout. And and um, I, I think it's just going to get bigger and bigger too as, as all the states are legalizing sports gambling. And, and I'm, I'm very excited about it. Yeah, and this might be a wild thought, but this is how I feel about like how Gen Z and Gen X have been conditioned. I mean, look at throughout COVID with platforms like Robinhood. These kids are all seemingly day traders. They love gambling money. They love risking money. And when you bring that over to sports, I mean, for instance, like I watch the UFC from time to time, uh, you know, when it's the bigger fights like McGregor and names that I recognize, um, I, man, I've watched three different UFC bouts in the last like three months, just because my buddies were putting money on it. I'm like, I want to get in on that action. So I think it just incentivizes engagement and you're always on pins and needles with these prop bets that pop up on all these websites. As it becomes legalized more, I think sports betting, it's just going to be a full revolving door of bringing people back in and it, it's going to be great for the sports. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm the one who's tasked with giving the stock league, league answer here among this panel. Um, but I, I, I share the excitement. It's, it's um, you know, buttressed a bit by the fact that for us at the NFL, representing about anywhere from 40 to 50% of the U.S. handle across 
nearly the totality of bets right now. What we focus on first is making sure that we can do this responsibly and be really sensitive to the integrity of the game. This is the original unscripted programming. What makes it great is, is the fact that it's it's safe and it's trusted. So it starts with that, it starts with understanding the, the legislation and the evolving nature of it. And once we get through those you know, very specific and serious topics, um, we're really excited about the promise of it because for media consumption, we recognize, you know, as, as Nate Shot pointed out, like there is so much potential here for the right type of consumer. And we look a lot at the UK market where we've played games for more than 12 years now and have a lot of, of, of investment in that market. Um, you know, sports betting in the UK is heavily regulated, but just a core part of the fan experience. It's very common. It's very natural. It's something this is going to take an entire generation for people to completely normalize and get comfortable with something that I will remind you has been legal in this country for 70 years, albeit only in one state in Nevada. It's just increasingly becoming, you know, legal throughout the country. And so for us, this gets back to that theme we were talking about, about personalization. What we're looking at really closely on the data side is how we can continue to create experiences, whether it's sports betting, whether it's a Nickelodeon broadcast. The point is this might not be for everybody, but we have the benefit now with technology of being able to offer it for those fans that are interested in it. And to the extent that we continue to look and monitor at the data, if over time that becomes the overwhelming and most popular type of feed, that will change the way the broadcast are done. That's happening already. But we have the nice benefit right now of being able to do both. And we'll continue to look at and experiment with things like that. So guys, we've got a couple minutes before we start uh, taking some audience questions, but I'll mix them in with some of mine. But wanted to move a little bit to like a, a speed wrap. Just real quick answers. I uh, want to make sure we get all four of your perspectives on them. Um, so maybe just to start, because you all are data-driven folks, and this is a data, a data and analytics conference, um, and you're all really trying to drive content and success. Uh, when you wake up in the morning, what's the most important metric you're looking at to know the health of your business? Maybe I'll start Nate Shot with you. Uh, for me, man, it's, it's pretty simple engagement. It, how, how many likes did this post get? How many comments does it have? You know, my partner, John, I told you, Jordan, he's obsessed with the follower count. I don't really care about the follower count. As long as the engagement on the post is continuing to rise over time, that's all I care about. Christine? Yeah, I would say the same. I'd also loop it with consumption. Um, we've seen kind of Twitter tweet conversation volume kind of steady out depending on what event we're, we're looking around. But for us at the end of the day, it's the quality engagement that we see across different events and conversations. Is, some, is someone replying? Are you having that conversation? So um, I think for us, definitely a quality engagement and consumption angle for sure. Omar, how about you? Yeah, same same thing. Um, engagement, um, interaction rate, and I think one more uh, metric would just be like views, video views, uh, and where do we rank with everyone else? Yep. And Blake? So I can't say the same thing as everybody else just because that wouldn't be any fun. So I'll give you three, but obviously engagement is a part of it. But the game, our fans, and engagement. The game, we actually have a game quality index. We have a quantitative way to look at every NFL game and rate it on a scale of one to 100 based on level of excitement, player health and safety, stoppages, anything related to the game itself. That's fundamentally our product. Yeah. Our fans, things like brand sentiment. What is the reaction to that Twitter conversation or that game that took place or anything happening off the field? And then, of course, on the media side, engagement, whether that's TV ratings or anything related to our social data from interactions to video views. Awesome. All right. Man, NFL one. doing it right. Yeah. Holy. That is uh, wild. There you go. <laughs> send, us, send us that on a Monday, uh, on Tuesday morning. <laughs> the ranking. Um, so next question. Uh, what is what will be the fastest growing social media platform in the next 12 months? And then if you look in five years, look back, what will have grown the fastest between now and the next five years? Uh, Christine, I'm going to start with you. I think in 12 months, I, I would say TikTok, I think it's just top of mind for everybody right okay. now in the way that it has just really grown like wildfire with that younger audience. Um, I start to see it not only on TikTok, but TikToks are on Twitter. TikToks are on Instagram. And I think the shareability of that will continue. Um, in five years, 
It's a good question. I, I look to Twitter given the, 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 the growth we've had and the, the kind of slow gains that we've had from a product innovation standpoint and, and monetizable DAU and things of that nature. Um, I don't think Twitter is going anywhere that the news piece for me just, just speaks volume to, to how important it is for, for culture and, and what we're serving with the power of conversation. So I'd go, I'd go Twitter, even though I'm biased. Nate Chad, how about you? Fastest growing 12 months in five years. I agree with Christine. I think TikTok, I, I think the biggest problem that people had with TikTok over the last year is like some people just said, I'm not downloading that app. It's for like 12 year old kids. And now everybody's networking, talking and sending in iMessage their favorite TikTok. So there's like a, a newer, like older generation that's looping back into the platform. So I still think there's a lot to grow there. Um, and then I think over the next five years, definitely YouTube. I think YouTube had a great strategy, a great pivot when they came out with YouTube Kids. I mean, if you look at like five-year-olds at dinner tables nowadays, they have iPads in front of them, they're watching YouTube videos. So yep. these kids from a very uh, young age house. are being conditioned. <laughs> I <to>, do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, and it, there's something there for everybody. And they're doing a, a, a great job of implementing like guardrails so that kids don't end up on the wrong part of YouTube. And adults, yep. there's everything that they want. Uh, the algorithm is really is scary. It's very scary how specific the content they will serve to you on your recommended page. And you'll just end up in this black hole. So I think YouTube's right. only going to continue to grow. They got a great leadership team over there. Hey, One of them Blake. being my friend. So I told him I'd give him a shout out. <laughs> Blake, 12 months, five years. So I got a non-traditional answer for you. Fortnite and Roblox. Yeah. Increasingly gaming platforms. And yep. Matt, you can speak more to this than me, but gaming platforms are social. Social platforms are about gaming. Everything is converging. It's fascinating to us. We've had a partnership with Epic for the last few years yeah. around Fortnite. And obviously we continue to work with EA Sports and Madden for going on 30 years now. These environments are increasingly about not just playing the game, but also people gathering and having conversation and reacting to things in another environment. That's going to be something that's going to continue to evolve. And we're really excited to be a part of what that is and, you know, and what that's going to look like in the future. Omar, what do you think? Yeah, I completely agree with TikTok. I, I think the creativity on the platform, I've, I've been doing social for seven years now. TikTok is the most creative content I've ever seen in short form. Um, so I think it's going to continue to blow up. And I do agree with Nate Chat though. Over five years, you know, I, all of my nephews and nieces, they're all on YouTube and, you know, you can watch anything on there and including like reaction videos now, which just get a ton yeah. of views. So it, it's incredible. All right, guys. So we have an audience question. I think it's pretty cool. Let me ask, uh, ask you all, how, how is social media bringing attention from Z Gen Zers into sports beyond just the big four, such as golf or uh, they said such as golf, I, I would add, you know, other things. As well, you know, rate drone racing, esports, uh, volleyball, etc. Who wants to take that one? Feel free to jump in. Uh, yeah, I'll I mean, oh, oh, go ahead, Christine. No, go ahead, go ahead. Sure. Uh, I, from a golf perspective, I think we kind of hit on this at the top. It, it, it's seeing the younger guys who are kind of making their surge in, in the in the tour, um, utilizing these platforms and, and drawing in that audience and, and seeing the other side. I think you look at a, at a, a Jordan Spieth, a, a Ricky Fowler, and, and those guys are giving you uh, content that you want to see. I remember on, when they went on that Bahamas vacation and spring break and it was on Snapchat and all their stories. And that gives you kind of that other side um, to what they're doing. So I, I think it's just involving those different voices and viewpoints that I think kind of draw uh, that younger audience in. I, I totally agree with Christine on the personalities and the younger guys that are starting to win more and leaning into social media. But for me, I think it's the technology uh, has caught up to the sport, right? So my buddies and I, we can go out with my Sony. I have it right here. I, we've been going out and recording golf on the, uh, on the course. And I've got my editor that puts in the shot tracers and we're uploading to YouTube and we're not the only group that's doing that. There are some gigantic YouTube groups that are creating user-generated golf content, and these kids love it, and especially the pandemic too, because all it was the only thing you could do for like six months. So a lot of younger kids are coming into the sport because they see some of their favorite personalities or some of the channels they've been served through the algorithm on YouTube by creating golf content. Now at my phone, everybody's recording every single par three. You're seeing more hole in ones. You're seeing more great moments on the course that aren't happening on the tour. And I think it's helping grow the sport. So I think social media is going to be a really, really big asset for the PGA. Um, and they need to lean in more. They, they really do. Uh, I love PGA. So if anybody here is listening, but you guys got to lean in more. I went to uh, the Rock and Morge Classic. Rock and Morge, one of our biggest partners. I couldn't record anything inside of the ropes because they own that comment, that content from like A to B. There's no other way around it. So they, they need to lean in more on, on content, social media. Cool. 
Um, question, new topic. Um, the question is, as the, as, as the NCAA moves to implement uh, and the NIL, right, allowing them to name image and likeness, do you see teams using an athlete's number of followers or their engagement as draft criteria or a way to pay them differentially? Uh, we really like player X, but player Y is, got, is more popular. Uh, I don't know, Omar, I'll throw that to you and maybe, <laughs> and then Blake to you, the draft's coming up. I, I have never thought about that. I, I, I can't imagine. So I think the thing is you can grow a player's following, right? If, if a player doesn't have that many followers, but then he joins a big team or has a big moment. I think we saw with, with Jalen Suggs, he gained, you know, a hundred, 200,000 followers overnight when he hit that shot, there's yeah. always ways to grow a platform. So maybe, maybe, um, you know, people like me will be more valued at, at, at some, some of these schools or the NCAA. <laughs> that's the way I view it. Turn up. Um, Cause I can, I can build anyone's following. That's my job. <laughs> I, I'll just say, uh, you know, look, being on the business side of these things and having worked quite a bit with NFL clubs and, and with their front office personnel over the years, uh, I'll never say never, but I'll be surprised when they start making decisions as to which players to draft or recruit based on anything other than their very deep, as we're here at Sloan, very deep analytic data on player performance on the field. Now, that being said, one thing that we've seen teams do a lot of is work with the players that they have, whether who they're bringing in or, you know, especially players that they have to help them grow their brands and try to, to lean in. But as far as, you know, this having direct impact on who we're going to see picked in three weeks, you know, as we get set to watch the draft on, on NFL Network and ESPN, I, I think uh, I, I think it's still going to be a ways off before, Wait, you, uh, you know, more social saying, following like, alone comes up with that. Like, are you saying you're not going to have Omar sit next to Mel Kuyper and talk about social following? <laughs> of players at the draft? I mean, I'd, lo I'd love to see it. Um, that would be pretty sweet. But I, I, I just don't know that it's going to have the direct impact on, I think it has impact in so many other ways, which is what's so exciting about this. Yeah. Um, but as as to which you know which players teams are ultimately uh, which uh, uh, players are ultimately getting picked by teams. Yeah. Um, I I could be wrong, but I think we're at least a little bit of a ways away from that. But Nate Shot, that's different for you, right? For esports, you a lot of the business model for you is actually having popular people on your platform. And by the way, also talk talk about uh, Valkyrie and what you did with with her this week. That's pretty exciting news and uh, oh yeah game. we took we took uh she's the biggest female gaming creator in the world she's been with us for three years she really had a monumental meteoric rise uh this past year and we brought her on as a co-owner as a, a, along with one of my uh, roommates uh jack who is another his name is Kurds, is another huge gaming creator so really just keeping it in the family they both deserved uh, a reward for all the time they put in and all the time they're going to put in over the future uh, but yeah, esports is a little tough because you're, 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 you're trying to balance. It's like a, a seesaw, right? It's like some players have a really big following, but they might not be as good. And some are really good and they don't give a shit about social media. So it's, it's a tough balance to strike. You know, sometimes those perfect storms come along, but at the end of the day, you know, the fastest way to growing a following, especially in esports is, is it really is to win. You know, if hundred thieves could win a little bit more, I mean, nobody, we could, nobody even have a torch to us right now. I mean, we've won some, but we do content so well, we just need to catch up with the championship trophy. So we're trying to figure it out, but it, it's a balancing act for sure. All right, guys, I think we have time for one last question. We'll do a real quick, maybe yes, no, and a quick explanation. But should we expect to see live sports on social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook and TikTok and others soon? I'll give you a TBD. I think we've definitely dabbled. And, and obviously, as Blake mentioned, with Thursday Night Football, things of that nature. But I think when you look down to the power of Twitter, we're really that that second screen and, and wanting to have that symbiotic relationship between what we're seeing on TV and then what's happening on the on the platform. Omar, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it won't be the same exact broadcast. I think what Twitter did with the NBA where they're following one player was really smart. Um, so I think we'll see more of that type of stuff where it's unique. Blake? I'll echo, I'll echo what Omar and Christine said. I also get the nice benefit being in my role of, of not being the one with the great vision to figure out how the products and platforms are going to evolve. What we'll think about is what's good for NFL fans and try to just make sure we keep making the best experiences wherever they are. Yeah. And Nate Shot, I mean, esports is already on, on live on social media platforms, et cetera, right? So you guys are blazing the trail a little bit here. Yeah, I want to see like YouTube make a just a ridiculous punch for like non-exclusive rights to the nfl or the nba one day i mean again broadcast rights are just a whole nother shit storm that i would never want to deal with and i want to impact the revenue on these leagues but 
the day that one of these leagues finds a way to put their content live on YouTube, it's, uh, I think that would be a really big day for traditional sports. And, and by the way, just the, the one thing to point out on that, Nate Shot, is what, what Amazon deserves a lot of credit for as well is the ability to carry live games and make the feed be in HD and not have buffering and the things that we take for granted. You know, television works really well for a certain thing, which is you can watch hours of it on in high def and it doesn't buffer and it doesn't flicker and it works. Mm -hmm. right. And, you know, the tech infrastructure is non-trivial. So for platforms to have made that investment and get that successful, it's something for us at Elite, we're always going to look at to make sure that it can support it so that those experiences that we deliver wherever they are, are of high quality for our fans. Well, look, everybody, this was, this was great. It's time to wrap it up. I wish we had more time, but thank you. Omar, Blake, Christine, Nate Shot, this was terrific. And thanks to all the folks at the Sloan Conference. Have a good weekend, everybody. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, all.